school today. There's been the reno. I'm sorry, young. I know y'all young people love Sunday school, uh, but we have the renovations taking place, and all of the Sunday school stuff has kind of been shoved into that one room, and so we need time to un. Uh, pack that stuff so that we can again resume Sunday school. Uh, praise the Lord. If you would open up your Bibles to Revelations 17 and 12, we're going to go ahead and enter into the Word of God. Oh, no, we're not. Somebody got a birthday. They thought they got away with it. <laughs> uh, why don't we stand? We're going to sing happy birthday to this young man. His name is Elias. <laughs> You thought we didn't get you. If we can sing happy birthday, he's right there. Look at him in the back, right there. A happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you. May you feel Jesus near every day of the year. A happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you. And the best year you've ever had. Woo! Every year. Everybody gets at least one chance to testify. Testifying means that you're just going to tell the people what great things God has done in your life. Would you like to testify, you big chicken? Uh, <laughs> that'll be, uh, so he can never say he didn't get a chance, but it's not a requirement. I'm just teasing him. I love Brother Elias. We just want to thank him for being here. He helps me with the camera uh, on a weekly basis. So let's get back. I see almost, man. I forgot Rosie last week. If y'all weren't here, was it Friday? I rebuked her in front of everybody. Was it Thursday or Friday? Thursday. I rebuked her. I said, Sister Rosie, you rebellious woman. And I just, she didn't know what I was going to tell her, but she snuck out on Wednesday. See, she snuck out on me. I was calling her too. I was just about to catch her. But I knew she was coming back, so we got her anyway. Praise the Lord. Revelation 17, 12. It says, and then ten horns, I'm sorry, and the ten horns, which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as of yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. One hour is not a specific time, it's not just one hour, but it's a short period of time. Um, these, verse 13 says, have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall, this is where my text is going to come from, these, which is the ten kingdoms and the beasts, these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome. Somebody say overcome. overcome. The Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Amen. Mm, let's pray. Jesus, I want to be on the right team. There is a battle coming forth, and only one of those teams in that battle is going to win. Out of the two teams going to battle, one is going to lose, God. And, and Lord, I call on you right now to allow me to be on the right team so I can have heaven as my home. In Jesus' name, and the church said amen. amen. Clap on the Lord one more time. You may be seated. Once again, I'd like to welcome you to New Hope Pentecostal Church. I'm so grateful that you came. The church isn't the same without you. And I mean that. The church is not the same without you. And that means from the least to the most. And when I say least, it doesn't mean your value. It just means that are doing the least and those that are doing the most. So when I say from the least to the most, you are all important. You know, there's some people who just sit on the pew. They don't do nothing. But you know what? If they weren't on the pew, then they wouldn't have an opportunity to, to do anything later. So the fact that you're in the pew gives you an opportunity to step up when your time uh, has come. When you are uh, to that position or when the Lord finally gets a hold of you and, and, and you get to work. Uh, you can't get to that level until... You actually sit in the pew for a few moments, whether it be a few days or a few hours or, or a few months or even a few years. I prefer it not be a few years. But we have uh, an ending here. We're getting to the end. We've talked about many different attributes of the end time. Uh, man has it been scattered. I mean, I'm, I'm going to have to, what I'm probably going to do is I'm going to get them all and put them on the same 
uh, blog clip or, or what do you call those things? Each pay, uh, huh? link. No, they're all links on the blog and there's different blog dates, I should say. And I'm going to put, just like I did with the Kingdom Bible study, I put them all on one blog page. Uh, I'm going to do the same with, with the end time preaching. Hopefully next year, I like to preach this once a year uh, unless the Lord um, comes before then. But uh, next year I'm hoping that I can, I'm not going to choose the same time to teach it. I promise you that because that didn't work. We've been doing end time for like three months or something. It's, it's been spread out and visitors and special services. And, uh, but we're, we've, we ended last, last time we came together to talk about the end times. Uh, we talked about the rapture. And that was pretty much the last segment. The next thing is only what happens after the rapture will be done. And we're going to do that today. I've got another direction I need to go. Because the Lord has showed me through some things that Brother Bibb was talking about when it comes to what worship really is. So we're going into the concepts of worship. And then we're going to go into the ideas of uninhibited. Uh, so we're getting close. And we're getting more ready as a result of even looking at today. Uh, how Brother Mark came in. And how we had song service, how we had services Thursday and Friday. The Holy Ghost is moving. Uh, we're getting more open to surrendering to that spirit. And that's the only way we'll reach to the level of being uninhibited. To where we just don't care what anybody thinks. We don't care what anybody has to say. All we're going to do is go crazy for the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. So uh, the last portion, we're going to talk about this war that's going to come. Some people think this is World War III. Um, some people think that World War III is the war that comes before this. Uh, I'm not even going to speculate. After reading Revelation so many times, just when I felt like I had a grasp on something, something else threw it all for a loop. Uh, and so, uh, gratefully, I don't need to have the specific answers in Revelation. There's only, specific, only some real strong things that stand out, and I'm going to hold on to those and let go of the rest. Uh, I'm sure as I go through my yearly reading, things will come up and I'll deal with them. But until then, uh, we've dealt with the most important issues. Number one, it's here. We are in the end. There is no question. The, oh, man, I hate... I just, can I just teach you the truth? Can I, can I just do that? Because sometimes, you know, I, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I don't want to step on any toes. But the fact is, I don't have that ability. I don't have the authority to not tell the truth. I was watching, I think I was in Florida. I feel like, I feel like a jet setter now. I was in Florida. The last time I was in Elephant Butte. <laughs> I was in Florida, and I was watching the Pope, this new Pope. I think he was in Brazil, somewhere in Brazil. And I couldn't believe my ears when I was hearing he began to speak and said, and you know, when it comes to homosexual priests, you know, well, I, who am I to judge? And went on. And, um, now, don't get me wrong. Uh, in fact, who watched POA this morning? Anybody watch POA this morning? I, I loved how Brother uh, uh, Mangan was talking about, you know, we're not gay bashers here. There's too many, you know, regular people and, and Christians that are gay bashers. If you're a gay basher, then you need to repent. But when it comes to the scripture, we can't hold back the truth. Uh, uh, I'm not a homosexual man, but I can hug a homosexual man. I have no problem with that. Because they need Jesus. A homosexual man is no different than, than, than a fornicating man. Or a man who's drunkard. Or a man who's doing drugs. Sin is sin is sin is sin. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. And I want everyone to be saved. People don't realize hell is so bad that it doesn't matter what the sin was. It's just horrible to put you in that place. And our goal is preventing them to go to that place. But, he, he, but him getting up there as a person in the church, or supposed to be the church, saying that, you know, I'm not really going to judge. Oh, but you'll judge if, what were you telling me? The, oh, if you use contraception. Oh, yeah, if you use birth control, oh, we'll judge that. Okay. Or if you do this or that, we'll judge that, but we're not going to judge this. You know why? You know why? Oh, I feel it. Hmm? You know why? Because we have got to get to this level of society that we really are not going to take care of those big issues so we can all mend and blend together. So we can all just come together and nothing of, of, of a big nature really matters. Because that's one of the big arguments of today. And so what we've got to do is we've got to find a way to make those things okay. So that everybody will come to this 
kind of church or this one world church that's coming, that's emerging. When you see things like that, you know that the end is near. Not because homosexuality is such a bad thing, but to say that something, and I'm not saying it's a good thing either, but I'm saying to be able to say we're just going to mend and blend everybody together and ignore what the Word of God says. The idea of Muslims, there is a catechism already written in the Catholic Church that says that Muslims are included in the kingdom of God because they believe in Abraham. Do you know that the Muslim Church and the Catholic Church are the two largest churches and the largest growing churches? Well, the Catholic Church is not growing, uh, but the Muslim Church is growing. But they're the two largest churches in the world that make up the most people. All it would take is for those two to come together and you're this close to a one world church. And all you got to do is eliminate things like, you know, oh, it doesn't really matter. Just, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever you want to include is fine. We're all really going to the same place. We all really have the same God. That's where we're at, church. We are in the end, no question. There are things that the, the scripture shows us that we've gone over. And so what we need to do as a church is wake up. We got to wake up. Because if we're in the end, we've got to look at what we're doing every single day. And what is it in my life? We've got to evaluate our lives. Amen. It's time to, to clean out the closet. Yeah. There, there's some skeletons in the closet. We need to take them, sweep them out. Some of us got graveyards in our closet. We can get rid of those too. So many bones that can, you know, <laughs> just stop. There's a reason because there's a war coming. And there's going to be two sides in that war. One side is going to be the lamb and all of his, his army. The other side is going to be the ten kings and the beast and his army. Whose team are you going to be on? Because you're going to have to pick a side. You think, oh, well, I'm going to be in the middle. There will be no middle. Because if you're in the middle, you're just not in. Yeah, that's right. Middle is, middle is with them, not with God. So there's no middle ground, there's no gray area, either you're in or you're out. So now we have to preach these things and we've got to preach the truth. Why? Because there's going to be a group that are called, chosen, and faithful and they are going to overcome. I want to be on the overcomers team. I want to be on the winning team. I want to be on the team that's going to take me to a place called heaven. Let's go to the book of Romans chapter 11 verse 25. We are in a serious time, church. This is a serious time. This is no time for joking around. Romans 11.25 states. Remember the book of, I, I, I'm very uh, interested. You know, Brother Mark might be dragging me to the church a couple more times a week extra than I thought that I would be. I want to I hear the, the lectures on Romans. I want to hear that because Romans is indeed a powerful book. It's interesting how most of what I call modern day Christians jump right to Romans chapter 10, 19. and say, confess with your mouth and believe and you're saved. And they ignore Romans 1 through 9. They say, repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Ghost. Because that's what they say in Romans 1 through 9. Romans 11, 25 says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel unto the fullness of the Gentiles be come in until that time. Verse 26, And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. I will take away their sins. I don't know about you, but I don't want them. I don't want them. Sin has never done me any good at all. But there is going to be a time, and because we're talking about the end times, I'm going to give you a couple of things that Irvin Baxter introduced to me. Uh, I'm not going to go in too much detail about it, but I, I want to just give you a picture of Israel. Because it says that all of Israel be saved. 
But there's going to be a tribulation that comes and there's going to be Gentiles and Israelites that don't make it through the tribulation. But there, there is a talk in, in the book of Zechariah verse, chapter 12 verse 8 of, of an event that I want to share with you that's very interesting. And this is a prophetic concept. It says, in all that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Isn't it amazing that the Lord always got Jerusalem's back? They just kept messing up and messing up and me Oh, somebody better hear this. Falling down, tripping, messing up, but the Lord always, even if they let him fall for a while, let him flounder for a while, he always was there. And he's going to be there in the end because all of Israel that make it through the tribulation are going to be saved. I'm going to show you verse 9. Uh, where was I? And it says, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David. And the house of David shall be as God and the angel of the Lord before them. Verse 9. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Because remember that's where that battle of Armageddon is going to take place. They're going to come against Jerusalem. Verse 10, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for the firstborn. Let me tell you how Brother Baxter described it. Uh, when, when Jesus comes back to the Mount of Olives, he's going to present himself to the Jews. And he's going to say, because remember the Jews don't believe that Jesus still now do not believe. Isn't that amazing? They messed up all through the time that, that Jesus was here. And then after he left, after they crucified him, after he came back, still the main core of Israelites do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Maybe a prophet, but not God. And so, to demonstrate God's mercy, even of all that time and all their screw-ups and all their messing up, he at the end is going to stand there and say, do you recognize these? Right. And then, and only then, and remember they're going to have to have made it through the tribulation. And if they're still there, can you imagine what they're going to feel. This is something that, that we should understand because, see, we mess up over and over and over again. And we think, oh, no, no, God can't forgive me. No, no, God's not going to support me. God's not going to refill me. That's a lie from the pits of hell. Because if he can come back and forgive those that actually, oh, put him on the cross. The ones that actually put him on the cross and believe that it was all right to do. If he can forgive them, you think he can't forgive you? Mm. He's going to put his hands and say, it was I. Can you imagine the regret first that they're going to feel? Because he's going to show them. Can you imagine they're going to understand that the generations from the times of the Roman uh, captivity of, of the world, basically, uh, from that time, they have believed this wrong thing all this time. And they have, they have persecuted and come against, and not, I shouldn't say persecuted, but they've just fought against the idea and been offended and been insulted by our very teachings. And they're going to learn at that moment that those teachings were correct. And they were wrong all that time. Oh, I'm sure that when it says all of Israel will be saved, it'll be because they will be at a, such a level of repentance. There will be such a level of mourning of what they've done that all of them are going to be saved. They're going to make, I mean, they're going to fall to their knees and worship him for who he is for the first time in 2,000 years. Hmm. Now, if we are part of his army, it doesn't say the proximity of his army when we are, uh, Mark, do you know anything about that? The proximity, just, I'm just thinking out loud. The proximity of us from Jesus on the Mount of Olives talking to the Jews. Does it give us an indication about that? Yeah, we're going to be right behind him. Right behind him, okay. That's what I was hoping for. Because we get to watch it. 
if you're one of the called, faithful, and chosen. Can you imagine, okay, oh, can you imagine the revival that's going to take place when we, what happens in this church, when one sinner, when one drug addict, when one person is suffering, one alcoholic, one person that's just full of sin and every year, they come up here and they raise their hand and begin to repent to God and begin to God fill me and God, I'm sorry. Oh God, I love you. And they begin to speak in tongues. Just a couple, one or two. Can you imagine the house of David before us uh, really coming to repentance and getting, oh! <laughs> Can you imagine? They all start speaking in tongues and magnifying God. <laughs> I told you I got a good imagination. When I preach, I put myself right there. Wow! That is going to be a day. I know about you, but I want to be there. I want to be there to see that revival. That's going to be the best altar call I think there's ever been, ever. Can you imagine the joy of God? Who These are the ones that I, oh, come on, somebody. These are the ones that I love. These are the ones that I created first. These are the ones that are my children. And they're the ones that never received me. At that time, they begin to repent to God and receive him. Can you imagine the joy of the Lord, the delight from that level of repentance from the ones who he really loved first? Oh, oh my goodness. Oh, it's going to be amazing. This is the road to Armageddon we're talking about. And they're going to get saved. And then they're going to be able to be a part of the army that comes against these nations. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. So there's going to be those that are they're going to see the piercing. Now, Zechariah 13. Remember, Zechariah wrote this. 600 years before the crucifixion. Isn't it wonderful to have that kind of revelation? We're going to jump down from 12 to 13, Zechariah 13 to 4. And it shall come to pass in that day that the prophet shall be ashamed every one of his vision when he has prophesied either shall uh, wear rough garments to, to deceive Verse 5, but he shall say, I am no prophet, I am a husbandman, for man taught me to keep cattle from thy youth, or from my youth. Verse 6, and one shall say unto him that these wounds in thy hands, then shall he answer those which I was wounded in the house of my friends. In the house of his friends, the ones that were the closest to Jesus, the ones that wounded him. Can you imagine, you know, this isn't much far off from what we experience today because generally it's the people that are closest to us that hurt us the most. The people who we love the most tend to hurt us the worst. Can you imagine, I'm just, you know, in the same place where I just brought you, you know, Jesus being in the position of being spat on and, and, and slapped and, and disrespected by his own kinsmen. His friends, people who were supposed to recognize him for who he is. He allowed himself to go through that. Can you imagine how? I mean, when Romans do it, Romans are pagans. You know, when someone out in the street, oh, somebody called me a crackhead once. Somebody, or not, they say, oh, he's still smoking crack. <laughs> well, why don't you follow me around for a while? We'll see how true that is. Come to my house, hang out, see where the crack is. Only crack in my house in the walls. I'm only cracking my house on the sidewalk when you walk on the front. <laughs> People can say what they want about me, but when someone, you know, it's funny. I ask my wife sometimes, you know, how is that, how is that certain, how is, I hate to ask sometimes because I know if she don't say the right thing, I'm going to get hurt because I, I really care what she thinks. So when she says it was good, I'm like, oh, <laughs> good. Because when they're, when they're really good, she goes, oh, babe, that was awesome. And so I'm like, yeah, I, I, I got it. I hit it. That's, that's what I want. But when I don't see that, it hurts. I'm like, <sighs> and then I get to throw a pouting fit for about an hour, and then I talk to her again. But it's because she's close to me. It really matters. You know, it don't matter to me what these other people say about me. Say what you want. You know, I'm, I'm okay. Because I know where you're at. I know where I'm at. But when people are closer to you, it hurts more. People that you expect uh, to love you and care for you, when they hurt you, it's much more painful. I can only imagine, you know, it's bad enough that Jesus had to go through the, the torment and the, and the torture, but to be, to be treated that way by his own people, his own kinsmen. Let's go to Jude 14. 
If you're wondering why there's only one number, there's only one book, so it's only verses that follow the word Jude. There's another comment about this, this end time battle that's going to take place that I want to share with you. In the word of the God, it says uh, Jude 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these things, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints. To do what? To execute judgment upon all. Let's just stop there for a minute. My goodness. You know, I have people all the time, when I used to be more aggressive with, you know, trying to convince people of, of the modern day Christianity versus what apostolic faith teaches as the early church teachings, which I believe are true compared to modern day altered, uh, modified teachings. One of the first things people will tell me, you can't judge me. See, the Bible says to judge not. It's interesting how people love to stop right there. It says, judge not that you should not be judged. Talk about hypocrite. Then, the first, then it says, but first remove the, the, the moat from your eye before you remove the splinter from someone else's eye. Now what that means is, is that you're going to get judged. So the Bible's not saying not to judge at all. It's saying don't be a hypocrite when you judge. It says make sure that your house is clean before you look at someone else's house and say, man, your house is dirty. Man, you need to clean your house. That's a hypocrite. When your house is filthy. Oh, look at your house. That's a shame. So what it's saying is before you're going to correct someone else's behavior, make sure that you are repented before you teach a repentance baptism or a repentance Bible study. Before you're going to tell someone they need to stop a behavior, make sure that you have stopped your behavior. And then if you don't allow yourself to be corrected, you know, that's what it means. You, don't, you can't judge me. It means please don't correct me. And the Bible from front to back is about correction, exhortation, about teaching people the error of their ways. That's what Paul did. That's what the apostles did. It was correction. Now, I've got something that God gave me as a revelation. We're supposed to judge. We're just not supposed to do it judgmentally. That's good, huh? I like that. You know, that's when God gives you those, those are like the, the revelation jams. Judge, just don't do it judgmentally. Let me give you the difference. Uh, someone's involved in a relationship and they're not married. And they're, in, and they're having premarital relations and they're not married. This is judging judgmentally. You know what? You're going to burn. You should not be doing Let me tell you something. You know what God thinks about that? God thinks that that's horrible. So he thinks you're horrible. And so you, you better stop being horrible to the Lord and get right. If you don't get right, you're going to get left. Okay? They can even come up with little slogans to put you down. And, and by the way, this guy's, you know, got six or seven girlfriends that nobody knows about. Okay? But when you judge and you don't do it judgmentally, what you do is you bring them the word of God and say, listen, I understand uh, that you're used to a certain living, and, and, but when you come to God, God wants us to change. You know, it's, it's normal that you, I understand where this comes from, but you know, God has a different idea for us. And there's reasons why he wants us to change. Because these things are, 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 are going to cause problems in our lives. And I'd like to see you get better. I'd like to see your life get better. So why don't you let me give you some of these attributes that are going to help you please God. Why don't we try not having any girlfriends uh, that you're involved with sexually until you get married. It's called Purity. See the difference? See, we were supposed to judge, but we're not supposed to do it judgmentally. And so those people that are doing it judgmentally, they give us a bad name. Because as soon as we begin to correct, they're like, ha! Ah, don't judge me. But you know what? If we come to them enough times with enough people who learn how to do things the biblical way, they'll be able to receive the engrafted word that can save their souls. Sometimes you can have the right message with the wrong approach. I know I was a king of that for many years. Take that Bible and just whack him. What's wrong with you? You believe what? Come on, man, really? You're like, oh, dude, come on. Praise the Lord, because most of you wouldn't be here. <laughs> Praise God, I was still doing that. We'd have a small church. Praise the Lord, it says, 
to execute judgment upon all. I'll tell you what, I promise you, man, I'm, I'm having so much fun this, boy, this afternoon. I promise you, you want me to judge you first. Because you don't want to wait till Jesus judges you. Amen. You better have yourself a little pretest before you pat, before you take the big test. Because if you don't take a pretest, you might fail your test. No, oh, come on, you don't want to fail that test because there's no retakes. There's only one test. But if you take a couple pretests, you can fail them. Learn your lesson and then take the big test. So, you know, promise you, allow yourself to be judged now according to the word of God. And let the man of God or the pastor or the leader of the church or even the saints in the church begin to love you enough to tell you the truth. There are changes that we have to make. And if we don't, we're not going to pass our test. And then it says, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all of their ungodly deeds... Which they have ungodly committed. And of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. There's going to be a judgment. And all those people that speak, when it says speak against him, see, I'm, I'm going to take it a step further because I'm a believer in Jesus in the way that he wants me to believe him. So when it says, that this, when someone's teaching a false doctrine, they're a sinner. They just don't know it. It's unfortunate, but false doctrine is, is about something that's ungodly. And so people speak against those that bring the apostolic faith. And they're going to be judged. And they're going to be judged for this ungodliness. You know what's interesting is? Is that when I was talking about the Jews and how they're going to come to that level of regret and understanding, when they see the, that he, he was pierced and they're going to know it was them that pierced him. It's no different as a modern day Christian. Those that actually came from that Judaism and came into a belief in Jesus that he was God or that he was the Savior, those same, there's going to be a large number of those same people who are going to get the same reaction but it's going to be too late because the Jews are special. I don't know why. They don't care. It's God's call. That's his thing. They're special. But when he comes and he goes to those people, see this, oh man, I'm telling you, this is deep. See, they got a, they got a second chance at this. You're not going to get that second chance. Don't ask me why that is. I don't, I don't, don't tell me it's not fair. That doesn't matter. When we get told, he said... Uh